Welcome to the Sea Trade Maritime Podcast. In the fifth and final of our bonus episodes for the half year market's outlook, we focus on the shipbuilding market with Adam Kent from Maritime Strategies International. Adam, uh, what has been the trend for new building orders as a whole for the first half of 2024? Contracting during the first half of this year has come in at around 50% of the total volumes that we saw during 2023. So the year started off on on a positive footing. As Tim's mentioned, I think if you look at all the sectors, it's it's tankers that have seen the greatest increase this year versus last year, being driven both by the VLCCs and the product tankers. Most of those orders, interestingly enough, now are going to China, even the VLCCs, whereas 12, 24 months ago, they'd have been more likely to go to a Korean yard. I think what's also been interesting is that we did see a tail off of container ship contracting at the back end of last year and at the start of this year. But with the recent uh, rate increases, we've seen a large number of owners, both liners and non-operating owners, sort of going back to the yards and ordering large volumes of container ships, the likes of Danaos, uh, Eastern Pacific and Navios have all recently added to their order books and of course as ever that's going to be driven by the earnings hikes. Another sector where we've seen a lot of ordering this year has been the VLGC market uh, and VLGCs that are being ordered with ammonia capabilities. Uh, Of course a lot of those owners are now looking to the future and the increasing trade in clean ammonia as we move through this decade into the next. The problem is now that we, we think there's around 70 vessels, uh, VLGCs with ammonia capabilities on the order books. That may well be far too many on order when we match it up against volume, certainly over the next five years. So there's positive that the vessels are being ordered, but uh, we don't think that the, the clean ammonia is going to be there. So those vessels will be trading LPG and may well put downward pressure on the, the overall LPG markets as we sort of move out to 2030. I think if you're going to go and order a vessel now, we are still seeing a few vessels being squeezed in to 2026, but the majority of vessels that will be ordered in the second half of this year will find a delivery date more likely in 2027 and even into 2028. I think it's still depending on who you are, what you're ordering and where you're ordering it. But yeah, we're now looking at sort of towards the back end of the decade rather than the middle of the decade for new deliveries. And then finally, on the new bill price, they did start showing some signs of levelling off as we sort of moved into 2024. But with the recent surge in orders for containers and some of the tankers, we've seen new building prices sort of edge up a little bit further midway through 2024. There's still a lot of demand there and, and from sectors perhaps where we hadn't expected it to continue like container ships. What's happening on the yard side in response to this? Are we seeing sort of an increase in capacity from the yards? I think it's important to realise that shipyards or being a shipbuilder has not been a profitable industry for some time. And finally, we're seeing a number of these yards actually becoming profitable once more. And I guess there's, there's two ways in which... Uh, you can sort of look at expanding shipyard capacity. One is is sort of opening up new yards or in many cases sort of mothballed yards. And we've seen this happen over the course of the last three or four years, in matter of fact. A number of the, the yards that sort of were there during the period 2008 to 2013 but were perhaps sort of mothballed in 2016 have recently been reactivated. There's been some Big names that come to mind, places like Rongsheng, STX Dalian, Hanjin. These are all yards that are now actively employed in shipbuilding, typically under new owners, but also their output isn't back to the levels that we did see during the heydays of the sort of 2010 to 2013 era. So new capacity is coming on stream. The other way that capacity can expand is to increase productivity. And I think this is something that the Korean yards have struggled to do recently. Uh, They had some huge productivity gains perhaps 10 years ago, but uh, the Korean yards are now suffering with a labor crisis. 
there's certainly uh, struggling to attract things like welders. Uh, and that sort of keeping productivity and increase output down at a lot of the, the big Korean yards. Whereas China, on the other hand, we've seen output go through the roof during 2024. There have been a lot more scheduled deliveries expected out of China in 2024. As a marker, over the last sort of four years, output from Chinese yards in the first half of the year has been around 10 million GT. And this year, we think that's more like 16 million GT, so a huge increase in output in Chinese yards. Now, one explanation for this is that because we've seen generally the weak construction sector in China, a lot of the labor force are moving from the construction industry across into shipbuilding and deploying their trades with shipbuilding rather than the construction industry. And that's enabled them to increase productivity. I was talking to some owners two weeks ago in New York who were telling me that the Chinese yards were asking them to take delivery of vessels six months early. Obviously, they've increased productivity, but of course, the Chinese yards also want to maximize the number of orders that they take during this sort of peak in new building prices. And more generally, we also think the sort of restructuring and the consolidation of shipyards in China over recent years are also now sort of bearing fruit. There's better organization around the yards and also the flows of materials at the sort of more consolidated level versus a very expansive level that we saw perhaps in 2010. It's very interesting around the productivity of the Chinese yards, and that's a huge increase, that number for the deliveries that yeah, you mentioned exactly. there. I mean, it would seem that China is now very much the dominant force when it comes to shipbuilding. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the case. And I think China have always wanted to become the dominant nation in terms of shipbuilding, but also wanting to build the sort of higher end, higher value assets. In 2008, 2010, you know, the majority of Chinese shipyards were, were building bulkers. And, you know, that, that is the sort of sector where you cut your teeth, so to speak, in shipbuilding. And then you move along the sort of value curve from bulkers to containers to tankers to gas, ultimately to sort of row packs and crews. And we've sort of seen China at somewhat of an accelerated rate over the course of the last 15 years or so, being able to sort of push themselves up that value curve where, of course, now we're seeing there's five yards in China that are able to build or at least take an order for LNG carriers. Whereas uh, 24 months ago, there was only one yard. So we're certainly seeing that rapid evolution in Chinese shipyard capabilities and capacities. There is an extremely rapid for a sector like that. If we look at the flip side of that, so if you look at the second half of the year and beyond that, well, how do you see new building demand faring? We expect to see new building carry on relatively strong this year, given the heightened earnings. But we do think as we sort of move across into 2025 that we will start seeing a drop in some of the contracting. We do see owners being put off by the long lead times, put off by the high new building prices. And certainly for, for a sector like, say, dry bulk or, or tankers, put off by the, the, the sort of general uncertainty in terms of around what technologies what engines to order on board ships. I think some of those players in the market would like to see a little bit more certainty and a few vessels actually come out of yards and actually being run on clean methanol or clean ammonia before they sort of place their bets on the fuel of the future. So we do expect to see contracting come down next year. We do expect deliveries to carry on that sort of a rampant rate. That ultimately means that yard forward cover will drop. We've also seen a reduction in shipyard costs. Still, plate price at shipyards is around $600 per tonne now. At the peak of the market, it was near $1,000 a tonne. So with a slight reduction in costs and a, a reduction in shipyard uh, forward cover, we do next year expect to see a slight softening in the new building price. But I would emphasize it's a softening. It's not a collapse in the new building price, just as we see more deliveries come out of yards than contracting go in and the order book to go down. If we look at over time at that sort of net position of the order book versus new building price changes, we do see 
very good correlation between the two. As we sort of move on, perhaps into sort of 2027, 2028, we do then expect to see another further pickup in things like dry bulk and oil tanker contracting. As I say, once we see a little bit more certainty over sort of new technologies. The one other thing I would just add on, on the shipyard in the future, I think something we've been spending a bit more time looking at is the demand for shipbuilding capacity relating to both retrofitting, whether that be engines or the fitting of energy saving technologies. And I think that will also cause further demand for shipyard capacity as we move across out into sort of 2030s with a lot more vessels that are currently on the water needing to do something to sort of maintain either CII or their position in terms of emissions more broadly to meet regulatory compliance. But that would be looking more at the repair yard sector rather than the sort of new building yards, I presume. Yeah, I mean, some of those new building yards will undertake also repair and retrofitting. So I think generally there could be a shortage as we sort of move out sort of five years time for those sorts of yards and their capabilities. If you've enjoyed this episode of the Sea Trade Maritime podcast, make sure to subscribe on the app of your choice. And we look forward to joining you on the next episode.